Hello, it's Scott Manley here in Palmdale, California, because this is the only place I know of where they have an A12 next to an SR71, which is pretty amazing. So just a quick rundown. The A12 is the original kind of prototype. It was super secret operated by the CIA. It was a single pilot. It was slightly shorter, lighter, had less payload. The one on the right, SR-71, had two crew members. It had an extra operator in the back. It had more fuel. It had uh, extra sensors. And so here's the thing, the A12, is actually a lot more secret. It wasn't revealed until like 1981. It was flying for two years before the SR-71 Blackbird was officially revealed to the public. But anyway, because the A-12 is slightly lighter and smaller and everything else, in theory, it's actually faster. But of course, this is all classified, but we might find out more. You see, there's lots of different sources. According to the CIA's website, the A12 had a 15 mile per hour advantage over the SR-71 with a 5,000 foot uh, ceil flight ceiling advantage. Whereas the plaques on display at the park that were put together by Lockheed give uh, the A12 a 10,000 foot advantage and a 100 mile per hour excess speed. And then there's this top secret document from 1967, which is uh, intended for intelligence analysts to help plan their missions. And it makes the vehicles look even closer, but stresses that the SR-71 can carry a lot more payload. So it's no surprise that the SR-71 continued to fly longer. So yeah, we're just gonna walk down the side of these things. There's not, it's actually very hard to tell the difference. They're very often confused. Uh, again, the main difference is that you have one crew member in the A12, which is, means, of course, that it has had a far more exclusive clientele. The only people that have flown this have been the CIA, whereas, uh, of course, the SR-71 had a pilot in the back that didn't need to fly the aircraft. So, uh, you know, congressmen would sometimes fly in the SR-71 and therefore sully its good name. Now, before we go further, let's just rewind this. Well, the side of the aircraft doesn't say CIA, obviously. It says Air Force. All of these birds had Air Force written on the side, but it was only CIA that ever flew them. You'll also notice the second one from the bottom is the trainer version. There was only one of those ever built. Now, the first actual Air Force aircraft to be struck from this mold, so to speak, was the YF. 12, which was supposed to be a high-performance interceptor. Instead of cameras, it carried a munitions bay that had three air-to-air -air missiles. They were AIM-47 Falcons. It also carried a second crew member that would operate the radar. Anyway, this Air Force program was made public in 1964, and this was pretty convenient for the CIA because they could then say that if anyone saw an A-12, it was in fact a YF-12. Three of these YF-12 fighters were built and tested by the Air Force, and in 1965, they actually ordered 93 of the production version, which they would have called F-12Bs. But Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara wouldn't release the funding because he wanted it for the Vietnam War, and by 1968, the threat to the US had transitioned away from defending the US airspace and essentially they decided they didn't need to fly these anymore. So the production version it never happened. So of the three test units, they all had kind of interesting stories. One of them crashed on landing in 1966, and while the front half was damaged beyond repair, the rear half was actually salvaged, and it was combined with the front half of a static test airframe to make an SR-71, and this was called the SR-71C, also known as the Bastard, because it wasn't quite right. It apparently never flew straight. <laughs> But I did actually get to see this unique hybrid aircraft. It's on display at the Hill Air Force Base Museum in Ogden, Utah. The remaining pair of YF-12s ended up being operated by NASA, who of course used them as high-altitude, high-performance research vehicles. And they actually used the stuff they learned to solve problems and improve the performance of the SR-71. In particular, the engine intakes had all sorts of interesting interactions with the rest of the airframe. They would uh, sometimes have unstart problems that were related to the position of the, the shock cone intake. But then in 1971, they had an in-flight fire on one of the aircraft and it was lost. So they needed a replacement and the Air Force came up with something called a YF-12C. 
This was actually an SR-71. It had been given a fictitious tail number. Uh, the reason why they committed this subterfuge was because NASA wasn't actually allowed to operate the high-performance reconnaissance version of the SR-71. So they had to make it look like a YF-12, which they were allowed to operate. So, depending upon how you look at it, there's one and a half YF-12s left and on display in museums. But that's more than the third variant of the A-12. They only built two M-21 carrier aircraft. What would you need to carry at that speed? Well, the good news is they actually had it on display at the air park. This here is a D-21 drone. This was a supersonic reconnaissance drone here. And uh, the main thing about this was that, well, it was originally designed to fly over enemy territory and collect information. And then when it would get to the far side, it would drop its payload out the bottom, which would, of course, contain all the important film. And that, that would be developed. Then, of course, it would self-destruct because it was super secret and super awesome. Now, it was supposed to be launched from a special variant of the SR-71 or the YF, uh, whatever called the M-21. Unfortunately, when they tried to fly it, uh, they had an incident and the aircraft was lost. So uh, they then converted this to fly from the B-52. Uh, they flew about four test flights. None of them were particularly successful. And so eventually the project was ended and shut down. And so we just have a few of these in air parks all over the place. Including the Chinese Aviation Museum. One of those drones that went missing, it was eventually found, recovered, analyzed, and put on display. The D-21 was powered by an RJ-43 ramjet. Now, because it's a ramjet, it doesn't have any moving turbine blades or anything to compress the air. It entirely relies on the forward motion of the air being compressed into it to actually make the engine work. That's why they had to launch it from an aircraft that was able to fly above Mach 3. So the launch aircraft was designated the M-21. It was a, another direct variant of the A-12, but had a second crew member seat, and it had a pylon on the back to secure the drone. When the accident forced them to switch from the M-21 to a B-52, the B-52 simply wasn't fast enough to get that ramjet going. So instead, the B-2 was locked onto the D-21, which carried on its belly a big solid rocket booster that would actually get it up to a ramjet speed. In fact, the booster was heavier than the drone. The drone was only about five tons. The booster was six tons. It was also longer. But yeah, they would eventually get the thing up to speed when they launched it correctly. And uh, unfortunately, it never really completed any missions. Anyway, by the end of the 60s, the A-12s were mostly packed up in a hangar in secret. The program hadn't gone public. It wasn't until the 1980s that it was officially acknowledged. And yeah, the one that is on display in this particular park is the very first prototype that was built. So this one that was on display that I was looking at was the forerunner to all of these aircraft, including the SR-71, which we all know and love and often get confused with all these other cool aircraft that came before it. The SR-71 flew right up until the late 80s and then continued to fly after that as a research vehicle for NASA. Now, all of these designs, the A-12, the SR-71, and the D-21, were seen as kind of the last hurrah of aircraft surveillance. They were supposed to replace the U-2, which at the time was looking kind of vulnerable. It's sure it could fly at very high altitudes. Uh, when the project started, the Gary Powers incident hadn't yet happened, but it was well understood that Russia was getting their missiles higher and higher. They do have a U-2 on display in this, uh, in this little air park. And interestingly enough, the U-2 still flies today, so it has outlived the aircraft that were initially pitched to replace it. And this longevity probably owes a lot to the U-2 being a simpler design, much slower, and probably therefore easier to maintain. Be it boring and practical compared to the awesomeness of the SR-71 and the A-12. And I tell you what, this is my son Orion, and he probably loves the faster planes, but... Hey, you know, the U2 is pretty cool too. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.